Uh, good afternoon uh, from Manila. But also, we'd like to uh, start this uh, webinar. This is second in a series of webinar by the University of the Philippines, CIFAL Philippines. And uh, this time, uh, we all welcome you. We welcome everyone all over the, the world. There are, we, we welcome uh, 147 registered participants to this webinar. And uh, we have people tuning in from practically all over from Armenia, Austria, Australia, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, United Kingdom, United States of America, Bahrain, Egypt, Kuwait, Libya, Madagascar, Oman, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, India, and Singapore. And we have as well our national, our local organizations. There are various uh, participants coming from the Department of Affairs, the Filipinos Overseas, Commission on Human Rights, and other uh, Philippine government agencies. We have as well among our registered civil society organizations, uh, recruitment agencies, research university think tanks, including the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism. And of course, we have with us uh, people from uh, international and national academic institutions, the International Organization for Migration, and other United Nations agencies. Thank you very much for uh, signing up, for joining us in this uh, afternoon's webinar. I appreciate very much your participation and your cooperation. We also have uh, people, prominent individuals who are joining us, Board of Regents of the University of the Philippines, uh, Commissioner on uh, Human Rights. Uh, we have Iscalibrini Migration Center, the UMWA under the DFA. We have also uh, Ambassador to uh, Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, uh, Labor Attaché. We have uh, members of leaders and board members of civil society organizations. We have from the academe, the Miriam College, and the Women and Gender Institute, and we have ICMPD, Attorney Golda Roma, uh, tuning in and joining us in this particular conversation. Uh, once more, we are proud to uh, co-sponsor along with the Rights Corridor and also together with the International Organization of Migration this particular webinar, which is entitled COVID-19 as Mobility Crisis, Repatriation of Migrants from the Gulf States. As uh, we very know, this topic is quite relevant and timely at this point over the world, not just in, uh, relevant to the Philippines. Uh, as it is, migration and mobility is a global issue. And at the moment, it is doubly, doubly important and crucial because migration is impacted by COVID-19, the pandemic, and likewise, the pandemic impacts on mobility and migrants. And at this particular time, we will look at two sides, two angles, migration, mobility, and the movement of people from the Gulf states particularly, uh, to the Philippines, back to the Philippines, but uh, we have to also look at the trigger of this huge, enormous mobility uh, crisis, which is the COVID-19. Uh, on both ends of the world, whether it is coming from the Gulf state or considering to the Philippines, mobility to the Philippines, there are challenges and issues to that both face in the context of coming home to the Philippines but also moving from the workplace. So in this particular uh, uh, webinar, I'd like to uh, first say to our audience, to the participants, that the webinar is fully recorded and that the presentations of our experts and resource persons will be shared through the email addresses of our participants after this webinar. 
we will have a, a generous time for question and answer from the audience. Uh, and for purpose of viewing by the panelists, uh, they may look at the Q&A uh, portion at the bottom of their computers. And uh, hopefully we have uh, a reserved time for the Q&A. I, in, I please request that everyone speaks in English because our participants come from all over the world. Now, uh, as a way of introducing this topic, we see on the map uh, here the spread of COVID, the distribution of COVID all over the continents in different countries. And globally, as of uh, last night, we have a total count of 5,691,790 cases of COVID. And obviously, we have a large uh, number of cases in the, in the North America, but also, as you can see here uh, on the screen, the Gulf registered, the Gulf registered the 96,794 cases as of uh, yesterday. And the map speaks for itself. Uh, the biggest, as you can see, comes from Riyadh. And you also have Qatar, and so with the others uh, uh, that you see on the map. So the Gulf states are actually uh, very much affected by the pandemic. Next, please. Because of this, uh, we also have to look at the uh, uh, we, we have to look also that in the case of the Philippines, uh, we have various players in terms of uh, migration. Uh, the employment characteristics is actually, uh, uh, the employment is characterized by uh, diverse government, by the private uh, recruitment agency, hiring a lawyer, and there is a very little figure there, uh, which is... Uh, uh, recruitment by uh, other sectors. So, um, as you can see, uh, we have the uh, recruitment and the social protection uh, being uh, taken care of also by these different sectors. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, the private recruitment agency plays a large role, a big role, in the in recruitment itself as well as in social protection. Next, please. And as we go on uh, with the presentation, as uh, we can see, uh, we will be looking at uh, repatriation as a big issue at this point in time. Uh, repatriation of migrants is itself ordinary times, an issue which is uh, by the Philippines in terms of absorbing and keeping our professionals and our uh, migrant workers, but extraordinarily during COVID times, there is a huge number of those who are being repatriated. And particularly this afternoon, I would like to give way to our special speaker coming from and who is an expert on uh, uh, the Gulf states. Therefore, uh, we have with us, may I welcome our panelists, uh, first of all, uh, we have in our battery of uh, expert panel and panelists. We have our key speaker coming from, who is himself the managing director of the Rights Corridor, Froilan Matma Jr. I'll introduce him in a little while, um, more lengthily. We have our favorite, our friend from the Office of the Undersecretary for Migrant Workers Affairs under the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Honorable Undersecretary Sarah Lou Areola. Thank you very much for joining us, Ma'am Yusek. Uh, we also have with us a very experienced uh, person from the uh, LBS Recruitment Solutions and uh, the uh, CEO himself of a recruitment agency, Mr. Lito Soriano. These are the two uh, uh, reactors to our key speaker. But uh, in the end, we have our partner in crime, so to speak, on the issue of migration, always there to support us. Uh, Christine Dedi from the 
International Organization for Migration in the Philippines. Thank you, ladies uh, and uh, gentlemen, for sharing with us the panel today on the webinar. Without much ado, I give the floor now to uh, Mr. Froilan Malit. Uh, Froilan is actually, as I mentioned, the founding managing director of um, the Rights Corridor, an advisory committee member of um, the ILO Regional Office for the Arab States, an associate at the Gulf Labor Markets and Migration, a research fellow of the UPC FAL Philippines. He worked at the Abu Dhabi Dialogues Permanent Office and at the Office of the Philippine Ambassador at the UAE. He's currently doing his graduate studies on uh, international relations and politics at the uh, University of Cambridge. And he graduated from the Cornell University and the University of Oxford. So may I welcome, let us all please welcome and listen to uh, Froilan Malit Jr. You have the floor, Froilan. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Adnoko, for this exceptional opportunity and collaboration. And thank you to uh, our CIFO uh, staff, uh, Catherine Lau, Luke, and Rice Quarter staff members as well, Henry and Angelo, and our distinguished guests um, and panel members. Uh, I want to thank uh, our Labor Attaché, Felicitas Pai, our Consul General, Paul Raymond Cortez, our Philippine-based partner, um, Carmelita Nuki, and my colleague, um, Gerasimo Sarafas from Birmingham University, for collectively offering legal, political, and rights perspectives, you know, in the context of the Philippine Gulf Migration Corridor. Now, the coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's an exceptional crisis uh, placed um, in an exceptional moment in contemporary times. And in recent months, uh, COVID-19 has tested uh, governments, uh, domestic and foreign policy institutions, the healthcare system, and the, even their patients. And if you look at, you know, this kind of crisis in the past, the Philippines has dealt with a lot of crisis. Um, in Libya in 2014, uh, in Kuwait in uh, 1990s, uh, in Iraq 2003, and in the UAE as well, the financial crisis in 2008. But the difference between this crisis and those prior crises uh, was that the, the COVID-19, it's a global one. And the prior ones actually were, uh, occurred uh, both at a national or regional context. Now, as COVID-19 intensifies in the Gulf region, uh, a lot of Gulf countries you know, have started to using more uh, restrictive policies to protect right, their economies. And as a result, we see this massive uh, floating unemployed population um, and these populations have to deal with a lot of the no work, no pay culture and uh, COVID-19 has then moved from a public health uh, risk to more uh, economic um, security and for foreign policy risk and one element that I will talk about today is this issue of migrant repatriation. Now I've divided this presentation into three specific areas. First we'll look at the context and data um, we'll specifically look at how high share of migrant population and sectoral, migrant sectoral uh, distribution uh, dually offers opportunities and risks for Gulf states and funding countries. And as cases go up, uh, we will look at Gulf states' political and policy responses, you know, in the context of migrant repatriation and how they support and undermine sending countries foreign policy protection measures in the Gulf countries. And lastly, as Gulf countries move, you know, towards economic recession and eventually follow a more harder repatriation approach, meaning mass repatriation, deportation, you know, more fines, localization policies, and migrant expulsions in certain cases, the question is, are sending countries policies like the Philippines realistic and sustainable in governing migrant repatriation? So, I specifically looked at three uh, questions here. Uh, and um, next slide, please. Right, so three questions that we'll look at. First is how did COVID-19 impact Gulf countries, domestic and foreign policies related to labor migration? And the second part is, you know, how did these policies differentially impact 
different categories of sending states, those strong states versus those weak states. And what do these political you know, dynamics mean for a country like the Philippines in a most post-COVID-19 migration context? So let's look at these different questions. So if you look at the data, right, pre-COVID non-migration contacts, in the Gulf, you have about uh, 53 million population. This is the third largest migrant destination uh, globally. So you have about 29 million um, migrant workers. 70% of migrant workers are either in UAE or in Saudi. And Saudi is the most populous one, roughly 12 million. Now, a lot of foreign migrant workers outnumber locals in the private sector, um, although there's a huge proportion as well of you know, migrant workers in the public sector as well. Now, during the pre-COVID um, <coughs> crisis context, high share of migrants you know, often would constitute high benefits. So for a lot of Gulf countries, this could mean more income, you know, the, the fees that are being extracted from processing all these migrant workers' documents, right? Um, and it also helps them close labor market shortages that they needed across sectors, be it domestic, hospitality, nursing, etc. Now, for some countries, it's actually great during the pre-COVID because you have high levels of remittances, access to employment, and remember the interstate relationship between you know sending countries like the Philippines and the Gulf. It goes beyond labor. It, it also you know is linked to trade, agriculture, investments and a lot of interstate economic you know, arrangements between countries. Now, who actually dominates you know, the Gulf sector? So next slide, please. So some states actually uh, dominate se certain sectors than others. Now, if you look at the current uh, data, 90% uh, of migrant workers actually come from South Asia and India constitutes roughly 7.3 million. Now, you know, over the past decades, different sending states have actually, you know, carved a niche for themselves. So, for example, India has been able to dominate, you know, the construction, hospitality, the nursing sector, and a lot of the engineering, too. Now, Philippines, for example, has also dominated specifically the nursing, domestic work, uh, construction in certain cases, in certain fields, and the hospitality sector. Now, what you're seeing here is that Gulf, sorry, sending states have used different methods to actually secure their competitiveness. And it also reflects how aggressive they were even in the past, right, to protect and actually secure a higher share because higher share could, you know, give you more higher employment and higher levels of remittances. So to an extent, they reciprocally exploit their national, you know, national resources, in this case, labor. And this also shows you that it's a complex sort of, you know, calculus, both in terms of domestic and their foreign policies. Now, next slide, please. Now, with the current context, it's, it's flipped, you know. So high migrant share would now constitute, you know, more high risks in high certain migrant, you know, sectoral distribution, like domestic work construction, especially those who live in high-risk industrial camps, constitutes, you know, high, you know, risk for a lot of Gulf countries and sending countries. So for the Gulf countries, High propensity of migrants, in this case, UAE and Qatar, for example, 90% of their migrants are actually, you know, they're, they're migrant workers. So they outnumber local population. So that, that basically could translate into high propensity to spread the virus, right? Um, specifically linked to those undocumented migrants as well. Now, for sending countries, that could mean low remittance. That could mean resource constraints um, in terms of their budgets, uh, in terms of the capacity of their frontline diplomatic missions to extend protection. Now, as cases go up, right, Gulf countries, you know, have begun to, have struggled to actually, you know, manage this particular COVID-19 effect on their local economy. You know, they've done a lot of mass testing, yet they had to face a lot of these, you know, economic tensions in terms of imposing, you know, tougher lockdowns to control the spread of COVID-19. They injected 180 billion in total uh, to help, you know, the private sector uh, to rejuvenate sort of the local economy. And right now, the cases are going up, yet they're still, you know, partially opening the market because they have to survive, right? So what you're seeing here is that with all these lockdowns, there are different proportions of migrants who are facing, you know, unemployment, no work, no pay, and Gulf countries have also revised their labor laws in order to protect, you know 
private employers as opposed to migrant workers. So as a result, you have this economic shock. Gulf countries have to create different you know, methods to A, reduce you know, this high migrant population share, and at the same time, limit the risks, right? Um, specifically in the context of undocumented migrant workers. So if you look at their repatriation policies, next slide, please. You can clearly see that different countries like Bahrain and Kuwait use amnesty measures. So they actually, all of them want to reduce the share of migrant workers. Bahrain and Kuwait are slightly smaller, so they use amnesty policies to reduce uh, public health risks specifically related to irregular migrant workers. UAE and uh, KSA actually focus on those either stranded or migrants who've just completed their contracts because they wanted to make sure that they would directly target these and reduce you know, high migrant population share. Now, if you compare and contrast these you know, particular approaches, what you could see here is that uh, Gulf countries with high migrant share, like Saudi and UAE, in terms of absolute numbers, so we're looking at 22 million here, the 70% of migrant uh, population share in the Gulf countries, they're very cautious. And instead, they use incentive-based repatriation model to slowly, right, phase out workers. Now, there's a lot of criticisms, you know, from the international organizations that you can't really repatriate without addressing these social protection issues, you know, just making sure that a lot of these workers would get the appropriate rights that they have, unpaid wages, et cetera, et cetera. So big, you know, Gulf states, Saudi UAE, they're cautious, incentive-based, wanted to reduce population measure, and they cannot impose an amnesty because these countries are huge and it requires bureaucratic, you know, institutions, resources, and it also violates their social distancing measures. So they're very, very cautious. If you open the market, that 22 million, that's going to create a drastic effect on the air economies. Now, countries, smaller countries like Kuwait and Bahrain, they actually took a more rigorous, you know, and aggressive um, approach, you know, within the context of humanitarian uh, policies that they have. So they pass these amnesty, and specifically to deal with like public health risks. Right, and, and incentivize undocumented workers to come out because it's very difficult if you're undocumented and you get COVID. Uh, you know, a lot of Gulf countries view those as risky because if you're undocumented and you fear being deported, you're more likely not going to report and you're more likely to spread this virus. So that's exactly what they did. So they're not homogenous, you know, there are differences, different nuances that they've taken in order to protect this. Now, with these political tensions, you know, Gulf countries actually struggle, you know, to handle this because they're running out of money, right? Sovereign wealth funds are also being uh, under pressure, no uh, tax collections. Uh, they're involved in, you know, different, you know, interstate wars. And, and Gulf countries have to find ways to actually shift this pressure because, you know, migration governance, it's a shared responsibility between Gulf and the sending countries. So, what a lot of Gulf countries have been seeing is sort of the different degrees of cooperation. So when I say cooperation, I'm referring to sending countries travel restriction policies, repatriation timing and response, and the type of diplomatic approaches that they've undertaken in order to address the repatriation process of their migrants. So next slide, please. And then the other one. Next slide, yes. So Gulf countries view, you know, the sending countries as high, medium, low sort of degrees of cooperation. Now, Pakistan actually has been the most proactive here, partly because of their regional security agreements, you know. And when I say proactive, I'm referring to the repatriation timing and quarantine um, approaches and, you know, the travel, you know, travel sort of uh, openings that they've done in order to quickly repatriate these nationals. They have high share here. That's why they, actually, they were able to act more swiftly in order to repatriate their nationals. And, you know, there are also pressures from Gulf governments to do that. Um, now, India, it has moved from medium to high. India has even sent a lot of ships and chartered planes, you know, to negotiate the repatriation of their nationals. Philippines is actually a bit uh, quite interesting because there's this interagency tension, you know, even within Senate, restricting sort of the proportion to 400. And then you have these diplomatic missions, you know, in the UA, in the Gulf, struggling to repatriate all these nationals. So you have sort of this interstate tension, right? This coordination issue. That, that's actually undermining the capacity of our diplomatic missions to deliver their work. And then you have smaller countries like Nepal with very small fiscal budget, right? Struggling to actually repatriate these nationals. So you have, you're seeing sort of different types of sending countries 
react to differently in order to repatriate these um, their nationals. And Gulf countries are either rewarding or punishing these. So rewarding in terms of giving them preferential trade um, agreements and relationships, um, and you know certain diplomatic favors, and then punishment um, in terms of restricting potential quotas and blocking sectoral work permits. I think Ms. Tetis Manahas mentioned this. And what you're seeing here is that the way you deal with them, the way you engage with them, you know, would eventually lead to these rewards and punishments. And UAE uh, basically sent a very clear message to a lot of sending countries, you know, a few months back, that if you don't repatriate, you will face these consequences. And I think that's what triggered a lot of sending countries like India and Pakistan to act swiftly. Yet they are constrained because they have also domestic populations of billions or even millions that they have to deal with, plus their foreign migrant population, you know, outside. Now, next slide, please. So as Gulf states, you know, use this different sort of mechanisms, right, to repatriate these nationalities, different migrant nationalities, you know, different states would then lead to different precariousness, right? So there are, and, and sorry, and, and these precariousness are often linked to the, the type of fiscal policy um, in terms of budget, um, interagency coordination, their institutional maturity in terms of migration governance, uh, Philippines actually being a leader, and a lot of studying countries are, you know, basically following the Philippine model, the political leadership, and the role and influence of diplomatic missions. Now, Philippines has been sort of the most proactive one because it has been able to extend optional repatriation, which is complementary to the Gulf policies, and social amelioration, you know, assistance, the $200 plus the free food that are being given, you know, across the Gulf countries. I've seen it in the case of, you know, in Dubai, you know, with uh, labor attaché politics of Dubai, extending all these support, you know, and then you see less proactive states, you know, with low proactive, like for example, in Nepal. Um, in fact, Nepal is still developing its contingency plan at the moment, right, to repatriate these nationals. And you can clearly see here that, you know, given sort of the different types of fiscal budget that they have, institutional, I mean, um, institutional maturity and sort of political will, it affects the degrees of proactiveness and cooperation. And that in turn, you know, produces diplomatic tensions with Gulf countries because they are constrained domestically. And, and I think that's an interesting question that uh, I'm pretty sure the Arts Undersecretary would further unpack in the case of the Philippines. Now, the third part of the you know, talk would look at what happens if Gulf countries, you know, if cases go up and they actually start using more harder repatriation measures. So at the moment, it's optional. So at the moment, what's happening in the Gulf is that they're using both direct and more recently indirect right, methods of repatriation. So as you can clearly see here on the next slide, please. So direct methods. Um, they're using deportation, right? So in the case of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, what they're saying now is that if you violate curfew policies, you could be deported. But before that, you know, they were very flexible, but now they're actually more uh, aggressive in terms of addressing this. And actually that could really serve their interest in terms of limiting or reducing the number of migrant population. Localization policies, you know, have also kicked in. So uh, Kuwait, um, has decided to phase out migrant workers in the public sector. Oman's Ministry of Finance has encouraged its private sector to eliminate you know, migrant workers except those working in the cleaning industry. Kuwait also has passed and, and is currently discussing their cultural diversification policies where they would impose you know, race-based quotas. Like for example, only 15% of Filipinos can live and work in the Gulf, right? And these policies have been in, in the past, actually, but they were not strongly influenced because these are, you know, private, the difference between Gulf and a lot of other a East Asian countries is that Gulf countries, they follow a private sector recruitment model, but East Asian, they follow more government to government. So Gulf countries, in turn, are powerless in terms of determining the proportion of migrants that they have within their private sector. Indirect methods are also using, you know, economic measures like VAT cost of living and expenses, the fees and sanctions if you violate the, these policies. These are actually indirectly pushing migrants now slowly, right? Because it makes them, you know, it makes it difficult to live in the Gulf countries with these type of restrictive, you know, draconian economic policies. Social policy as well, when it comes to the real estate, the housing market, and the limited social welfare assistance and repatriation tickets, only Kuwait has actually offered free tickets to these migrant workers. 
Now, the real estate part is very interesting because they have to make sure Gulf countries are very protective of the value of the real estate, and they're really not lowering the rent um, for a lot of migrant workers. And I think that creates a lot of issues uh, in terms of you know where in, in terms of whether migrant workers will be able to survive in, in the long run. And then the, the other part actually looks at you know these soft repatriation models. Um, they do contribute significantly in terms of reducing migrant share. Now, all of these different cases, right? It really brings in you know, the, the issue of the Philippines. All right, next slide, please. So th there's a medium cooperation, right? Because Pakistan is doing quite well than Philippines, and there's a high degree of proactiveness, right? So we want to actually repatriate, right? Yet at the same time, migrants resist, and this has been historically justified, you know, in the case of Libya. And workers actually, they try to cope, you know, because they don't trust, you know, to a large extent, our government's ability to produce jobs in the Philippines. So they're willing to deal with no work, no pay, the wage cuts, bad living conditions. They're ready to fight because they know, right, that they, are, they have much better economic opportunities back home. I, those are both perceptions and reality. Now, they also use illegality as coping strategy. They would say, I'd rather be illegal here and make money in the informal market than in the Philippines. And even, you know, low quality or no access to healthcare, housing, or informal markets, I mean, they just don't care because they want to stay and fight because they believe that they have more economic prospects here back home. And what are the implications for this, for sending countries like the Philippines? Well, our foreign policy. It's, it's a lot difficult to actually define your foreign policy when you have, you know, your nationals resisting, right, to cooperate because of their own certain reasons, you know. Our missions as well have also been impacted because you couldn't really deliver much, you know, when, you know, there's a less degree of cooperative uh, sort of, you know, framework between your migrants and then the government. Legitimacy as, legitimacy as well is, is a big factor because it, it kind of challenges, you know, whether the, a state like the Philippines can protect in the case of, you know, migration crisis framework that you're seeing at the moment. Now, if you look at some of the policy questions I just want to raise to our undersecretary. So, next slide, please. So, the first question is, are these policy responses that we're doing, are they sustainable and or medium term and long run, given the defiance of Filipino workers, they will stay for the next six to months to one year. And that's a fact. So how are these going to affect our approach? The second question. And so the question is, you know, as they move from soft to hard mandatory repatriation approaches, you know, how is it feasible, right? Um, again, to challenge uh, their choices, you know? And I think this is something that I, I do hope our uh, panelists will be able to unpack even more. And then the third question is, how do you envision, right? Um, I, I think, yeah, so basically, how do you realistically manage this pandemic crisis, you know, when you have a dwindling fiscal budget, interagency tensions, and growing domestic populations help is economic security back home in the Philippines? 100 million there, 10 million plus outside. And the last question basically is, you know, how do you envision, you know, the post-COVID-19 Philippine labor foreign policy towards, you know, author, uh, authoritarian states like the Gulf and the Middle East, Asia, and other destination countries. And the last point that I want to make, um, Dr. Edna, um, is that Gulf migrants, you know, give political legitimacy to the Gulf states and sending states. In fact, Gulf, you know, Gulf-based migrants like Filipinos, they are key ingredients to the long-term economic growth and development, right, of the Gulf states and also sending states. Um, in the Philippines and other Asian countries. The key bottleneck question is, you know, how can labor sending countries like the Philippines develop a foreign labor policy that favors rights, um, access, and better welfare protection, specifically in the co context of health, while at the same time maintaining strong diplomatic, you know, presence um, and reputation and relationships, you know, with the Gulf countries. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. The whole uh, package of ideas, very rich ones, very comprehensive as well. I think uh, uh, you have touched on many dimensions of the labor migration, not only on the Philippines, but uh, you have uh, showed us also the context of the Gulf and how other countries who are uh, similar to the Philippines sending labor migrants over to the Gulf states have been uh, behaving. Uh, but I think. Uh, 
you, you raise some very interesting questions which are thrown back to the Philippines and to uh, Filipino uh, governance and Filipino leaders themselves, which is uh, what's going to be the outcome of uh, the policies, uh, whether the policies are, have, have to do with labor policies, with social policies, or with, even with diplomatic relations to the Gulf states by the Philippines. So trying to narrow down now, we're looking at from a very large Gulf states perspective vis-a-vis -vis the individual uh, countries who are sending migrants to the Gulf states. We're now focusing and streaming on uh, the Philippine case. And uh, for this, uh, I think uh, there are some aspects, some, some questions raised by uh, Froilan, which can probably uh, be uh, further enlightened uh, uh, to us by uh, uh, someone from the government sector, the Philippine uh, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs. And uh, I'm referring to our next uh, speaker, uh, our reactor to uh, Froilan Malit's input and her thoughts also on how Philippines uh, deals with repatriation of migrants at this point in time. Our, our reactor, our next speaker is uh, the Undersecretary for Migrant Workers Affairs of the Department of Foreign Affairs. She was Chief of Staff of the Majority Floor Leader in the Senate. Uh, she obtained her law degree from the Ateneo de Manila University and her LLM at the International Human Rights Law from the University of Essex. Uh, she has uh, an award in the roster of Gawad Mabini with the rank of Dakilang Kamano or the Grand Cross. I am now uh, giving the floor to uh, USEC Undersecretary of the UMWA, uh, USEC Sara Lu Ariola, please. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Ko. Good afternoon, uh, fellow panelists. And I'd like to. Uh, Greet, of course, the Chief of Mission of IOM, Christine Daly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before I started my reaction, I'd just like to give a brief overview about the um, repatriation process in the Middle East. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as of today, uh, we have repatriated already 6,457 Filipinos. Uh, from the Middle East. Uh, we have 148 sea-based OFWs. Um, they just happened to be in, in, in the port of UAE, so they were repatriated from there. Um, and the land base is 6,309. Next slide, please. Um, if you can see, uh, as to the numbers, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, UAE, Baghdad, and of course the biggest numbers, Jeddah and Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, I'd like to disagree with the main speaker as to the resistance of people who want to, repat to be repatriated. Actually, it's the other way around. We are deluged with requests for repatriation. Thousands of people want to come home. And um, the difficulty actually when the airports closed, uh, that was the bigger crisis that we have to deal with. In fact, when the airports closed, people were really bombarding us in our in social media and in our posts because they want to, to come home. We're expecting another around thirty thousand in the next two months from all over the from all over the world and particularly in the Middle East. Um, I won't name which uh, uh, which countries, but um, most repatriation requests comes from the bigger countries that host many uh, overseas Filipino workers. Um, now, it's a totally different thing. War is something that Filipinos can deal with, but definitely not COVID-19. At this point in time, when everything is uncertain, a lot of people, just because they're not earning anything anymore, they'd rather be with their family. So there is a deluge of requests for repatriation. Next slide, please. Um, as to the COVID-19 related assistance, we have given all our post-standby funds, which uh, is for repatriation assistance, provision of emergency supplies, medicine, food, and accommodation to overseas Filipinos affected by COVID-19. And 
of course, shipment of remains. Unfortunately, there are several Filipinos who, who died. Um, so allowed, uh, it's allowed as uh, if they want the whole body or the remains to be brought home. We allow it as long as the uh, coffin is hermetically sealed and subject to cremation within 12 hours upon arrival in the Philippines. And of course, the shipment of remains. Some Middle East countries don't cremate, so the whole body has to be um, um, shipped back to the Philippines. Okay, uh, actually that's all my um, um, my update, but I just want to talk about the GCC countries and their response to COVID-19. Not all GC GCC countries are created alike. Um, for example, Kuwait and Bahrain. Kuwait had um, an amnesty because they wanted to repatriate undocumented irregular workers. On the contrary, Bahrain has another reason for the amnesty because they want the irregular to regularize. Yesterday, uh, we were having um, a live uh, FB live with uh, the chair, the CEO of Labor Market Regulatory Authority, and he was saying that instead of uh, since the borders are closed now, instead of recruiting from outside Bahrain, they are uh, recruiting inside Bahrain, and since there's already a. Uh, um, they already lack medical practitioners like nurses. Many nurses in Bahrain who um, were in other professions have been recruited in the medical field. And in fact, he was even giving assurance that they do not have a separate uh, migration uh, my policy as to migrants because they treat migrants and citizens alike as to um, healthcare and uh, one of the problems also that is seen in the Middle East, I just had a um, meeting, web meeting with Ambassador Alonto a while ago, an hour ago, and Consul General um, Jack Cortez of um, Dubai, we were talking about the accommodations. The problem really is the, the migrants are being infected because they live in cramped accommodations. And um, of course, now Dubai is opening up. Um, it's uh, going to be a problem. And I think since uh, we have someone from the recruitment agency right now, um, perhaps because we're talking about a labor issue and a human rights issue also, right to health and right to work. Now the sleeping quarters or the accommodations is going to be eventually be part of the contract to protect uh, the health of our workers. Before we don't really talk about it, not all employers will give their workers uh, accommodation where there are only two to a room. But some of the employers will just give them, um, what do you call this, um, an allowance for the accommodation. So people, to save money, will live in cramped quarters. But that's, not, uh, that's now unacceptable for, um, for in, in post, in, during COVID. Um, as to the responses, of, uh, also before I go to the questions, we just like to say that one of the things, we have a very close uh, relationship with the GCC country. We have international assistance and cooperation with Bahrain. In fact, they have a flexi visa program that has worked for our Filipinos because it allows Filipinos to have multiple employers. And the Philippine government initially was the one who bought the visas for Filipinos. And now the visas are being given for free except for the medical insurance and some other fees. And they are encouraging now the migrants to take that so that if they get sick, they have a health insurance. Um, in fact, in Bahrain, we have the lowest number of requests now for repatriation. Ambassador Ver was saying there will only have 95 requests where we have 55,000 Filipinos. So if it can be done in one GCC country, then it can be done I mean, I think in others, it's just that they have uh, one of the um, very good practices in the Middle East and there is no intent to, to deport or, and they're not deporting actually, um, they, or to, to lessen the migrant workers there because they have an, uh, already an acceptance or they realize that migra migrants are part of their lives and Filipinos have become part of their society and they cannot live without migrants because 55% of their societies are migrants. And the same with UAE, with Qatar and everything, there are more migrants than nationals. As to the Philippine policy responses, sustainable in the short, medium and long run periods, um, actually if you go back to the Migrant Workers Act, the fact is 
we do not encourage migration. It was an option before when we couldn't um, we couldn't sustain our economy. But now the president has said that any Filipino who wants to come home should come home. That's why part of the migration process is reintegration. So um, we have to really work harder to be able to reintegrate our 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 OFWs into society. And we have also to realize that it is um, COVID nineteen is not here to stay forever, and there will. There's still life with COVID-19. As, as we can see, um, our household service workers are not asking for repatriation because they're an integral part of the home. Our um, health workers uh, are, there's, um, are still are, have the best uh, employment at the moment anywhere in the world. And in fact, all the Middle East countries are asking for our health workers. We just have a labor ban at the moment for health workers. And even Europe and in the Americas. So there's going to be um, that sector that will continually migrate. Um, we as economies open there will be more opportunities like now dubai has opened and um so those people working uh under no work no pay they'll be able to go back to work but the downside there is the risk will always be very high as to the mandatory repatriation process any uh, i mean we are not asking people at the onset of this crisis dfa was given the task to repatriate. At this onset, people who did, I mean, very few requests. But come April and now May, people just want to come home simply because they're there in the Middle East without their families just because they want to earn. If they couldn't earn anymore, they'd rather be here in the Philippines. So um, the only difficulty, of course, is ensuring that they're not infected and bringing them back to the, to the provinces. That's why we're hurrying to be able to accommodate the request. And if, you know, anyone who works in our embassies and posts in the Middle East, uh, the Philippine our OFWs are very frustrated because they cannot come home. They don't want to stay if they have no source of income there. And uh, the other question is how can sending, sending countries like the Philippines realistically manage this pandemic crisis following the challenges? I think one thing about about the Philippines, the and Filipinos are very resilient. Um, our labor department is doing its best best to create jobs here in the Philippines, and um, more more than that, also we I think this is also the time that a lot a lot of our OFWs are looking at the overseas welfare fund because we have 19.6 billion, which is I think to a certain extent. It's there to answer to for the reintegration process of our Filipinos. And uh, um, I think this is a trust fund and this is the money that, uh, and this is the kind of crisis that where it should be used. And I think I'm confident that it's enough or more than enough to, to, answer, to um, help our overseas Filipinos move forward and also to uh, rebuild their lives here in the Philippines. Um, what's our foreign policy? We still don't encourage migration. I mean, but it's always an option. And if there's going to be a migration, there should be safe, orderly, and regular. The COVID-19 crisis literally stopped trafficking in persons because um, there are, people can just enter any territory now and to, to, it's a blessing in disguise. And I think the COVID-19 crisis is a reset button for our uh, migration policy because it's like going back to zero uh we can uh, um it's our time to reflect on what's happening it's our time to reflect on what should be taken out of our policies it's in our, our time also to consider how to protect our our overseas uh filipino workers um in the end i think at the end of the day uh and I'm saying this with confidence. The GCC countries need us as much as we need them. Uh, migrants will always be part of their society one way or another. And uh, of course, our migrants, especially in the service industry and particularly for in the health industry, uh, like the kind of service that we give is second to none. And we will always be part of that diaspora. But what's important at this point is for us to be able 
to move forward in ensuring that the migration would be safe, orderly, and regular should our citizens still decide to migrate. But at the same time, as part of government, it's also um, time for us to really do double time to provide jobs here in the Philippines since there, there's really, we are expecting an exodus of our millions of migrant workers. We have more than 10 million. We have around um, 2.2 million in the Middle East. I don't think a million will be coming home because they're still needed there, whatever happens. But it's... Uh, as I said, it's, it, we're back to zero and it's an opportunity and we're very optimistic that things will be well and we will be able to, to fix uh, things and um, if they believe in building back better, we could have a better migration policy, a better protection, safer migra migration and this time, maybe this time, all forms of migration will be safe, orderly and regular. Thank you and good afternoon. All right, there you go. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for the very rich uh, input as well. And uh, Yusek Ariola has uh, offered, has steered further conversation on this particular topic. I, I recall that uh, as of yesterday, when I attended a meeting of uh, local government units uh, group, uh, what people are trying to say is that if there is one thing that the COVID-19 has brought as an opportunity for the Philippines and the Filipinos. It is for the Philippines to consider as well the call of the national government for a Balik Provincia program that coincides with the repatriation of our overseas uh, Filipino workers, the migrant workers. And I think this challenges, this uh, particular uh, situation challenges us to look into what's going to be uh, probably a long term or probably a reintegration program that is being offered by the country for those migrants who are coming back, who wanted to come back. After all, mobility and migration should be a choice. And uh, for as long as uh, uh, there are opportunities that are built around uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, the chances for Filipinos to work back home, then uh, we have uh, probably a better, and we can grow the economy better. Uh, so uh, let us uh, look at uh, the conversation also as something that uh, includes another sector in, a, in our society. And in the Philippine case, the recruitment agency or the recruitment industry is a very significant player in the case of migrant uh, workers from the Philippines. And the, uh, because of this, uh, we cannot not listen to a representative from the recruitment industry. I am now calling on our next speaker. He is uh, his chairman and president of the LBS Recruitment Solutions Corporation. Uh, personally, he worked in Saudi Arabia for five years before running the recruitment business for over 20 years now. He is president of the Philippine Association of the Service Exporters and the Philippine Association of the Manpower Agencies accredited to Taiwan. I am referring to no other than Loreto Soriano, who will talk about the impacts of the pandemic to the OFWs and the impact to the recruitment industry and what might be the future of the industry in the post-pandemic era. So may I call on now, may, uh, Lito, you have the floor now. Uh, are, we, are, we, are we missing Lito? All right. In the meantime, uh, that we're waiting for Lito Soriano, could uh, we also please try to look at, I invite the panelists to look at the Q&A. Some of the questions are already there. And uh, I think uh, uh, the Q&A is uh, growing. It's, uh, there are a number of questions now, which uh, 
many from our participants would like our panelists to answer. So if um, Lito is now ready. Uh, do you hear me now, Ma Director Go? Oh, yes, Hi. yes. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to Director Go and Sipal. Thank you for inviting me and also to my fellow panelists and to our panelists, you know, uh, to our mem uh, participants. My uh, brief reaction would be uh, our beliefs in the recruitment sector. In the GCCs, uh, we in the recruitment industry estimate more or less 100,000 OFWs will be clamoring for repatriation in the next 12 months unless by Guru's counseling and guidance to encourage these workers to be more discerning and consider changes in their salaries, uh, employment benefits, and increasing cost of living in the, in, in the Middle East. Also, they have to be uh, considerate also on the effort now by uh, different uh, Gulf countries to hire inside, meaning they will now allow intra-company transfers of uh, workers. Those that are being uh, retrenched or terminated will be uh, collected by the government and then offered to companies that may require their services. To bring home 50,000 to 100,000 OFWs in the next 12 months or more is a great challenge given the limitation of, capability, of capacities as well as cost in air travel. Uh, uh, now, if the plane can accommodate 400 passengers, the allowed would probably only 150. Repatriation will actually start soon as lockdowns and travel bans are lifted there and here in the Philippines. Employers may not have funds to provide free air tickets to its own uh, termi terminated or resigning employers when they start or wanting to go home. The Philippine government must adopt a policy of job preservation, preservation in the job site to maintain our share, coupled with heightened diplomatic and labor issues dialogues with host governments. We must be careful on, a, on, on our plans or the government plans to ban deployment of uh, nurses to GCCs while there is no hiring program for these nurses by the, by the Department of Health. Uh, the temporary ban, we don't know how many were hired uh, ex-OFWs or hired OF, uh, OFW nurses. We might be sending uh, wrong signals. Uh, we believe also that there must be an integrated and deliberate overseas employment recovery plan for this 45-year-old sector. Must be formula, uh, it must be formulated and included in the proposed 23 billion national recovery and stimulus plan of the government. I might proceed to my tip marks, uh, a profiling of the employers. Uh, as we have been recruiting workers for over a long period of time, uh, what, what happened actually is a, is a total stoppage of work. Uh, the, the problem is not just uh, health, but uh, it, it ensued a, a financial crisis that's now about three months. Majority of employers are dependent in government funded projects. So if the government, the, the current government will be uh, downsizing your budgets, uh, for this new fiscal year, then uh, it will heighten the chances of higher uh, retrenchment or even uh, lockdown, uh, bankruptcies among employers. Medium and large companies, as observed in 2008, uh, will be more vulnerable, may lay up and retrench more, a larger number of migrant workers, including OFWs. This, this problem is really ionic, you know? it's, uh, it's something very new, con such that contingency plans are rendered, are rendered obsolete by the COVID-19. And uh, very few companies in uh, the Middle East uh, have their own business continuity planning. But even if you have, uh, the economic climate is really full of uncertainties. Uh, you cannot predict what happens in the next uh, six to 12 months. Now, in the Philippines, uh, the profile of our OFWs in the Philippines, I'm looking at stranded. Who are stranded in the Philippines? 
uh, we, uh, there are a, a large number of balik mangadawa workers, or these are the workers that are on leave, or they were on vacation because they signed a new contract. And these are uh, returning with expired uh, reentry visas to Saudi Arabia or to the host government. And uh, a, a large number of them are stranded in the national capital region. Another, another uh, group of OFW that, has, that are stranded in the Philippines are those that were already selected by the employers and the recruitment agencies. And they have already completed all the recruitment process. Uh, they already have the overseas employment certificate, they have visa, they have tickets, but the lockdowns and the travel bans cut up. And a great number of them are also locked down here in uh, Metro Manila. The other group of workers that are stranded are those that are already selected, but are not yet processed in the PUA. Some of them may not ha still have visa, but they are about to complete all the necessary documentation for them to, uh, to leave. Next. Uh, and uh, the, uh, some of them are also stranded in, uh, in uh, NCR. In fact, our sector submitted to OWA the list of uh, OFWs that are stranded. These are the new hire OFWs, numbering around close to 7,000. And we are clamoring for, for support to be trans for them to be transmitted to back to your provinces. But the local government unit are asking for clearances. And also, there's a need for them to undergo PCR testing before they are going to be allowed to arrive or uh, get inside different uh, barangays, municipalities, and provinces. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, what is the profile of the recruitment uh, agencies? Very few have contingency plans. Uh, among us, uh, you can count uh, very few numbers. Neither, no one, uh, I believe, is, has, uh, has practiced or implemented a business continuity planning. Except for large household recruitment agency, those that are recruiting domestic workers, most of us does not have enough savings to last six months of operations. The agencies that has uh, no placement fee model, meaning we spend uh, in advance, the cost of recruitment, the cost of deploying them, have millions of dollars of receivables. And these employers are telling us they are unable to pay because they are also affected by the, uh, by the crisis and there's no more projects. Uh, why this happened? Uh, in the Middle East, the usual payment terms for skilled and professional uh, deployment is uh, between uh, 30 to 90 days upon arrival. So meaning we are, can only expect uh, payments from those services for the, for, uh, uh, that should, we should receive from the employers uh, after 30 or 60 or 90s. In fact, we have receivables that, uh, uh, that age up six months or one year. So we expect a, a, a great number, a, a, a reduction of our employees, a reduction of office space, closure of branches uh, will be massive. Uh, we will be requesting PUA to consider reducing the mandatory office space of agencies. We are required to have a minimum of 100 square meters, and we might not be able to, uh, unless cost of a high uh, rent rental is uh, goes down in the next six months, we cannot afford to con uh, continue having 100 square meters of offices. The biggest uh, uh, problem that we are now facing is that the mandatory liability insurance program that has been there since uh, November 8th of 2010, that we are covering all, uh, all our uh, deployed workers. You know, uh, recruitment agencies are not allowed to deploy a worker unless he enroll or pay uh, insurance cover for the workers uh, at uh, mandatory insurance package. What does it cover? It covers uh, automatic repatriation ticket in case of a uh, medical problem, no, uh, no fault uh, resignations, and so on and so forth. It also covers uh, unpaid salaries up to six months for two years contract. It also provides uh, $7,500 for uh, as an insurance payment in case of natural death and $15,000 for, uh, for accident-related death. 
So the insurance providers are telling us we cannot, under force major situation, uh, pay for the uh, for the uh, liabilities that we that we covered you. So we are saying if that is the situation and it's required by law that we are going uh, as we deploy workers from now on and we have to cover the, uh, them with mandatory insurance. If this COVID problem will last another two years, what's the use of that coverage? So uh, we have been uh, telling the secret our Secretary of Labor and our Administrator of PUA to help us negotiate or bring us to Land Bank and Development Bank of the Philippines to help us with uh, bridge financing. Uh, we, are, we are clamoring for our 1 million to 3 million uh, uh, interest, zero interest bearing loans to type, to probably help us uh, for the next seven months and hopefully we can cross, uh, we will be still open by 2021. So uh, that, that is a, a very dire situation of the recruitment sector. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lito, for that uh, input. And you raise uh, problems as well from the point of view of the industry. And you raise also questions. So all of these are uh, actually uh, a number of these questions are uh, issues that relate to uh, the governance of our uh, migrant workers and the entire industry. Before we proceed to, uh, to the, uh, the Q&A portion, to the questions and I think the panelists, may I invite the panelists to please look at the Q&A uh, portion uh, and see which questions are being directed at you. But be before anything else, we have, uh, CFAL Philippines has also received a number of questions prior at the start of this uh, webinar. And may I start with two of these questions. Uh, let me read out to you from the Schneider Electric, I think this is a private uh, uh, group. Uh, could we request to have the list of OFWs that applied online for repatriation, which should be available in the Philippine Embassy website in order that our OFW knows what is the status of the said application? It is also possible that the list provided have a tentative flight schedule posted. So I think this question is directed at uh, our uh, expert from uh, the DFA. And um, uh, the, uh, the other question comes from IOM uh, itself. Which government agencies are able to maintain statistics on, one, OFWs stranded in countries of destination with intent to return? And second, have returned to the Philippines. Is there a shared data hub that is being used and reported to for coordination on OFW return and provision of COVID-19 and reintegration support? So I think those two questions, those two sets of questions I read uh, probably are directed to you, Sec, maybe. Uh, yeah. Would you want to answer yeah, now? Yes. For the first for the list, um, we have to also realize that there are data privacy issues that have to be taken into consideration because not all of the values want their names to be made public or and if they want to return. So but um usually uh there is usually they're really told that they're going they're going home. Um but uh as to the dates, as of now, we cannot give definite dates of repatriation except when it's already approved by CAAP. Um, as you know, we still have limits in our airports. We are opening Clark next week, this coming week, uh, for, um, for chartered flights. But at the moment, what we know is that um, when the 24,000 OFWs in Manila have already been transferred, um, to uh, have returned to their home provinces and cities. That's the time that our flights will be more regular. Um, I, I think people don't realize it that uh, a lot of um, a lot of air, um, airlines are really complaining because they used to fly to Manila every day, and uh, but they couldn't do that anymore. It, this week, 
we just had three flights from uh, UAE, but it was previously cancelled since the first week of May. So it will be really more difficult for us to, to come up with something like that. But um, eventually, when things regularized and when we can even say what's the, the what dates that the flights are available, then we can, of course, we can put the flight dates and the repatriation dates, and the list could be given only to those people who are um, what do you call this who applied. But you know, I don't think it's something that we we would like to err on the side of caution that it's not for public consumption who comes home and who doesn't. And even, especially though, um, and a lot of OFWs don't even want their uh, relatives to know that they're coming home. Um, secondly, uh, the, for the, I'm sorry, uh, doctor, what's the other question for the data? Um, unfortunately, just like before, uh, we do not have co a common data because not all posts have uh, polos and OAS. The, the only thing that uh, we have uh, embassies and consulates general over all over the world, but not in, not in all countries. But what we can assure you is at least from, um, from the Americas, there are 31,000 seafarers waiting to come home. And uh, and it's safe to say that uh, the land base would be in similar numbers. And that's only for the next two to three months. Um, I don't really know what's the source. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a single data at the moment because we're getting it from our post, what the FAA is getting. Um, as to the sources of the other government agencies, we, um, I don't really know their exact source. But uh, what the DFA is doing is any person who comes to um, the embassy, who goes to the embassy or the consulate, um, we are fix, uh, We are helping them to come home. The good thing about, I think, we now have to, to look at, there are two kinds of repatriates, the sea-based. When you say sea-based, uh, the, um, the manning agencies have been very, very helpful and we're very thankful for their help because they do not only take care of the repatriation, they pay for it, they even take care of the hotels. So the sea-based workers are the most taken care of among our OFWs. But as to the land base, especially when the contracts have ended or the... Um, or the employers have filed bankruptcy, and then that's when the Philippine government takes over. That's all. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Yusek. May, uh, there, uh, there are a number more of questions in the Q&A uh, box, but uh, I'd like to uh, post here. Uh, there's a question for Froilan. Uh, under the post-COVID, will the Gulf states be again a major destination post covid 19 uh, and um, I, I think that's one for for Freuland to answer i mean absolutely I mean, if you look at historical cases of these economic crises a lot of these Gulf countries mobilize their sovereign wealth funds right in order to restore their domestic economies you've seen this in 2008 where there's a massive you know decline of migrant population and it skyrocketed right after that and a lot of these countries, they have, you know, ambitious economic 2030 agendas and they're still fighting and they know that they have to be resilient because they have no choice. And, you know, if you look at their, you know, international um, engagement in terms of building, you know, World Cup 2022 and then the UAE Expo, now it will be 2021. A lot of these, these Gulf countries, you know, are willing to risk, you know, and defy, you know, these expectations because they've had it before. So what's the difference now? Well. It's more global, but then, you know, you can't really, you know, stop, you know, countries like the Gulf because it's, it's the kind of uh, uh, market and the kind of, you know, uh, policies that they've, you know, um, you know, fought for for a long time. And I, I see them as sort of major destinations in the, in the future because if you look at Western countries, you know, highly restrictive immigration policies, the next best thing actually is the Gulf because it's an open market, right? And it, it's very much open to low-skilled, medium-skilled, and high-skilled. That's why the Gulf countries, uh, they're the largest non-Western migrant destination, and they remit $100 billion. And I do expect them to come back. And I, I want to respond to, to you, Sara, I mean, in terms of resilience. I mean, I've interviewed nearly a 1,000 Filipino workers in the Gulf. And if you look at the number of repatriations that you mentioned, it's 6,000 plus, and the intent are 27,000 or more. 
if you look at the proportion of that plus the number of displaced Filipinos, 170,000, you could really tell that there is an interest to stay at least six months. And remember, a lot of Filipinos, they remit their remittances, you know, back to the Philippines, the money. They don't stay here because they don't get, you know, citizenship or permanent residency. So when these crises occur, they were caught in this dilemma. They didn't know exactly what to do. So well, a lot of them right now are, you know, literally waiting for Gulf countries to either open or close their market. So a lot of them are surviving now because you have, you're seeing a partial lockdown in the case of UAE, it's partially open. Kuwait and Saudi because they're able to at least you know work part time and those who have still have jobs you know they're able because in the UAE for example 50% of workers are still allowed to work and actually go to the office same thing in Kuwait same thing in the UAE they're still trying to be resilient because there's still that economic opening for them and therefore as you said they are defiant to that extent but to go home I don't think so partly because you know what's the next best thing in the Philippines these people have children back home. It's expensive to study in the Philippines or even afford healthcare. Sure, you have universal healthcare system, but there are also caps. And at the same time, a lot of these workers, they have debt, right? I worked with our Philippine ambassador before to the UAE. And literally, like the, these debts are actually, you know, precluding a lot of these OFWs from returning back home. And the cost of migration returning back to the Gulf countries, it's very expensive. A lot of Filipinos have actually entered these markets illegally, right? Okay, illegally in the case, in the case of Philippine law, they, they entered on a tourist visa. The cost of returning back using a tourist visa, plus the highly bureaucratic procedures, the protection measures imposed by our government, are really discouraging them to return because the cost of returning here is actually a little bit more. And with respect to this sort of idea of us being still competitive, I, I'm still kind of questioning it. I've spent 10 decades, you know, 10 years, you know, in the Gulf countries. And I've seen the evolution of the markets here, partly because, you know, I agree with, you know, uh, Yusuf Farah that there are still competitive markets for Filipinos, like nurses, you know, and domestic workers and certain sectors like engineering. But, you know, with the Arab Spring, right, and the close proximity of a lot of African countries, remember, those are much cheaper. They can speak English and Arabs can speak Arabic. So there are, you know, similarities and benefits for employers. And a lot of them are actually maximizing now. And I'm pretty sure Mr. Loretto would agree with me that a rising number of African migrants here are slowly facing out Filipinos in the hospitality, you know, and other sectors too. Now, with respect to, you know, this idea of us not, you know, encouraging or discouraging migrants, I mean, it's very, very difficult. I mean, a lot of senior officials are also saying this to me for a long time, but I hate to disagree, partly because, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally, We've created institutions that could actually facilitate it. We even extract fees from Filipinos, from all these procedures. And we're even in the process of creating an OSW department. I mean, that is sort of like an issue that a lot of Filipinos, even researchers, are basically saying that we are further institutionalizing, maybe in a different context, in a different sort of realm. But, but, the, but the point of that, not encouraging it, I mean, I'm, I, I would hate to disagree with our you know, undersecretary. And the last part is actually with respect to reintegration. I mean, studies and studies have shown these programs have failed. They're not sustainable. And a lot of Filipinos, they've kept returning back. I can say by the World Bank study, some of the dollar studies, they would actually return back to the Gulf countries. And in fact, some of the you know, prior funds that were extended to Filipinos to start a business, they would literally resell these and actually use them for future migration. What's the alternative back home? I mean, if I want to send my kids, and remember, we have a high fertility rate, and a lot of these families, they have either families here or back home, and they want to send them to, you know, at university education. The costs are too high. It's, you see this, like, economic insecurities for a lot of Filipinos. And there is no way that I could afford to send my kids to Ateneo, to La Salle, or even, like, private universities, or even to go for a nursing. It's not livable because in the Gulf, you have at least contractual agreements. These are stable two years, assuming that they would stay and renewable. In the Philippines, you have contractualization policies. Six months, it creates insecurities. So I won't, you know, I would, I would hate to disagree with our undersecretary, but based on the research, right, on these data, I think we need, you know, to have more dialogue like this, you know, between the DFA and the researchers outside, because I'm seeing a, a different, you know, reality here. 
And I would hate to disagree with her, but I think, you know, to an extent that we are still competitive in certain areas, but to a larger extent, I would really hate to disagree. And knowing Filipinos here, I mean, a lot of them, for example, would, you know, before they would just buy, go to a store and actually buy their own food. But now they actually chip in like a dollar or two. So 10 people in one room could actually collectively, you know, cut their costs. And what the problem right now for a lot of Philippine diplomatic missions here is that if you're asymptomatic and you have COVID, there's no place for them because public and private hospitals or private facilities in the Gulf, they're overloaded with COVID patients already. India, for example, rented two villas to accommodate their nationals if you're asymptomatic and COVID. But for Philippines, we don't have a shelter. And I think that is an issue that, that's why in terms of capacity, <coughs> I mean, I would question it, you know, and I think a lot of Filipinos, even with the ACA program, 100, you know, 50,000 for sea base and land base and an additional 100. I mean, this actually fueled more intensity, like even, you know, anger from a lot of all of W's, partly because uh, okay. 250,000, right? So I think the last point that I'm making, uh, Professor, is that we do have domestic constraints. And I think this COVID, as she said, Right, it's really exposing our limits and also the prospects for a you know migration governance renewal. So that's kind of thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Froilan. That's a very passionate uh, response to the question, which brings me to the comments of Dr. Stella Go, I, which I, I cannot miss reading out. The experience with the current health crisis highlights the importance of seriously looking into integrating social protection provisions for our migrant workers in our bilateral agreements. And at the end of the day, uh, I mean, all of this experience also tell us that there is no other way but to support uh, and complement probably whatever the, the, the government agencies lack in terms of responding to the migrant workers and for really uh, putting our brains, our minds together and our efforts to say, how could we uh, come up with a more proactive policy in governing our migrants? I mean, uh, the, the pandemic has really brought and surfaced out a lot of problems and certainly uh, there are limitations to what uh, the government can do. It is centrally, primarily an actor in the field, but I think there is so much more that should be done and which all of us can contribute to. Uh, the industry is also there uh, to uh, shouting out for some assistance because of COVID. And I think uh, this also tells how much more work is needed for the, for the migration governance uh, to be addressed really uh, and uh, let me let me also um, move to the other questions there are so many uh, questions in the box and apart from it I think there are those which are addressed uh, also again to the to the good USEC uh, uh, there is one that says I think uh, on the skills not the the COVID-19, the pandemic has actually uh, shown us that the skills and knowledge post-COVID-19 may change. So what might be emerging skills and knowledge that are probably, uh, that we see uh, after this uh, pandemic? Uh, anyone who would want to reply or to answer? Um, oh. Doctor, I'll go ahead before Mr. Sariana, if it's okay, sir. Um, I, I think in a lot of sense that the the, the COVID nineteen pandemic wasn't really isn't something that was projected by any government. And uh, even if you're a first world country, I mean, if you look at what's happening in the U.S. or or what I mean, like the health system has I mean, it, it has shown how the how weak the health systems are all over the world because. Um, that's the I, I remember even in some very well uh, very developed countries if you are um, uh, as a, if you are asymptomatic or you have mild symptoms even here in the Philippines you are just going to be placed in your home you have to self quarantine and uh, but the thing is I, I think the health sector is something that's very very um, that will definitely um, even before this a lot of uh, 
ambassadors have already been telling me because they have aging populations in, in Europe and even here in Southeast Asia, they will be more caregivers, nurses, and doctors. And especially with this pandemic, and the <coughs> have learned and have realized that they have to really beef up their health systems. And of course, um, I, 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 well, um, when you're unskilled and you're a household service worker, and it's, a con I mean, there, I, to, to look at it, they're the ones who are now uh, not being displaced. I just hope they're getting paid properly and treated properly because that's a sector that we couldn't really reach until there's already an abuse. Um, and actually, it will really depend on economies that will open. Um, the service sector would always be there, especially if, for example, Dubai, it's pr predominantly, uh, it doesn't have oil. So it's really for tourism purposes and everything. So um, it can open. But at the end of the day, I think what's really important is we should revisit the contracts that we have. Uh, a while ago in the, what do you call this, in, in the chat room, they're saying that, do you want to take away from the um, from the OFW the, the right to choose where he or she lives? Actually, that's precisely becoming the problem now in the Middle East. It's because of the cramped quarters, the COVID-19 spreads faster. And that's also happening in Singapore because of the OFWs, um, the migrants stay in very closed quarters um, and they're very cramped there. That's why it's spreading. And if we have to live with COVID-19 and and if countries would still want uh, our migrants to enter the <coughs> part of their societies, then it's going to be part of the contract. A while ago, I was um, talking with Kwan Jen Jack Cortez and we were saying that, of course, Filipinos would like to save. But the thing is, because they're all only um, earning so much, I think it will really add on the cost of migration. But as a country of uh, origin, we really have to fight for this safety net or this safety because um, part of the labor standards. Because the, uh, what do you call this, you cannot allow uh, our migrants to, to stay where they're staying now. And uh, we have a lot of SOS from several migrants saying that one of them is positive, then everyone else becomes positive because they're overcrowded or they're just allowed to, to, to live in their, in their quarters. So we are see, seeing a lot of problems which we have overlooked before. Um, we just have to uh, be able to, especially the recruitment industries here, it's really important that if, if and when we are going to start deploying workers again, or, or if our workers start to um, be deployed with COVID-19, there will be new provisions in the contract. There will be um, new standards that we have to ask for. And by the way, unfortunately, the sea-based uh, industry, the um, cruise ships, um, they... That's one of the industries that really is um, really on a downturn because they stopped since March. They're paying for order repatriation. They're not earning now. So that's going to be a very, very big problem because uh, we know very well that the most well-paid are most of, of, of our OFWs are in the uh, cruise industry. And uh, we don't see this, I mean, um, the industry going back. Uh, or starting to um, to be um, operational again, and uh, not any time bef before the end of the year. Yeah. I... Yes, sir. Uh, if we go back to the, I, I agree. The health sector will be still there. Uh, will be highly resilient. But if we look at the data over the past fifteen years, the average deployment of uh, nurses. He uh, is in Saudi Arabia, and the average probably is about between six to seven thousand or eight thousand a year. That's not big enough. Uh, what is highly resilient, uh, starting uh, 2007, is the deployment of household service workers. Uh, I remember in my data presentation in University of Asia Pacific in 2012, the the average annual deployment of domestic workers to Saudi Arabia was about eight thousand. 8,000 plus. But when we signed the uh, household uh, agreement with Saudi Arabia, it rose to 64,000 in, uh, that, that was in 2012. In 2013, it rose to 64,000 and increases up to 100,000 over the next, next years and, uh, until 2018. So the growth 
uh, sector in terms of numbers is the household service sector. Why? And then the question would be, can they continue that number? The why could probably easily answered by the expanding middle class of the Middle East, especially in Saudi Arabia. The, before, the employers of domestic helper when I was there, up to middle of 2000, are mostly the higher end, the rich, the generals, the general managers, the managing directors, uh, the, the sheikhs. But uh, as the Saudi Arabia, especially after the uh, Arab Spring, when the Saudi government and the other uh, uh, Gulf countries pouring uh, a lot of uh, funds towards uh, involving the, uh, the middle class into the economy, uh, and the middle class start working, either as a worker or uh, if they are into small and medium industry, uh, business, they need more keep a person or a household to, to help them in their house. So we saw a great uh, jump, just that today, probably 50 plus percent of uh, OFWs in GCC are household related workers. Now, there's one data that I forgot to mention, UEA. Uh, in the data of Proylan, uh, it's be, uh, and also not only in Proylan, but the data of PU itself. United Arab Emirates has the greatest number of uh, OFWs. Now, you go, to, you go to data. The population of UAE is about 8 million to 9 million. But uh, the Emiratis are only about 1.8 million. The rest are uh, uh, expat. Can we hire and employ such great number of workers? I don't know the total now. I think there are about 200 or 300,000 OFWs in the Gulf. If you look at reality, I keep on pointing to PUA in 2009, when there was a global financial crisis and Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi was hit by the global financial crisis, the deployment to UAA in the next two years increased by 72%. Why? Because in reality, UAA is the transit points of uh, traffic workers. Most of the workers that are going through UAA that are documented are actually going to Jordan, where, where then there was a black there was a ban of deployment, uh, going to uh, Lebanon when there was a ban of deployment, to Syria, uh, to uh, Kurdistan part of Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and other parts of DCC. So I think we have to be very careful about the data. And then uh, in terms of uh, probably looking at it uh, uh, on the policy uh, in, 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 in the PUA. Now, uh, so other sectors, the, the, this, the silver lining or what is this, uh, something positive in the GCC? It might be, uh, be uh, you, will, you might not support me, but the leadership of MBS, uh, uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia might be, at, uh, will be very helpful during this crisis. We need strong leaders. We need innovative and highly uh, aggressive leaders during this time. And uh, the presence of uh, and the leadership of MBS in Saudi Arabia could dictate the pace of uh, recovery in the Middle East. Yes, Saudi Arabia has been to deficit spend since even before the uh, even before the uh, Arab Spring. But uh, uh, as soon as MBS uh, started uh, leading the Saudi Arabia, it started really a, a great change economically and socially. So. Uh, uh, after the election of uh, after election in U.S., we believe that uh, if there's a strong relationship between uh, U.S. and Saudi Arabia again, and they can help uh, in this uh, world uh, recovery. And uh, uh, if in Europe uh, Merkel will lead, or Macron or France will also lead, we need leaders actually. We need strong leaders in this uh, pandemic and global crisis now. And in, in uh, what I'm trying to say is that in Saudi Arabia or in the Middle East. We have this uh, Prince uh, Sultan, uh, uh, in, we call him MBS. No? And uh, in uh, Europe, we have uh, the France prim, uh, president and, of course, uh, Germany. And in US, hopefully, uh, our president, uh, Trump, will change his and uh, becoming more of an economic manager. Then uh, it will hasten economic recovery in the next three to five years. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. I, I think we're running out of time. I think I will just. Uh, pick out two more points and questions and uh, we can uh, uh, obviously we need the longer conversation continuing conversation yeah. on this about the Filipino migrants the first point is coming from King Belimak who said uh, I think this is for you uh, Sarah uh, if 
you can find solution for the kabayans that are currently kicked out by the landlords and they don't have place to go. And reports, there are reports that one family is already staying in the tent in the building corridor. And some of them have stayed in the parking lot and park. And we have suggestion for that. If you are willing to hear us, maybe they can connect to the UMWA. Is yes, there a way they could reach out to the UMWA, Yusek? Yes. On this? Um, yeah. Actually, we have an assistance to National Fund. I was, I can't remember which ambassador uh, I was talking to, but I, I know for a fact that I think during the um, during COVID nineteen, you're not supposed to kick out anybody. And uh, I, I was talking to Ambassador Joy Quintana yesterday. But even then, if it's happening, please let us know. Uh, we have uh, an online <coughs> it's OFW help, and send a message there. Uh, we have resol we have already given our post standby funds to respond to this kinds of uh, crisis, so they should be able to help them. And uh, actually, um, the 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 problem is a lot of those people who already booked their flights out of their. Uh, uh, book their flights to return to the Philippines are stranded because we closed our airports. And that's the bigger problem that we are facing now. And that's for all over the world, but um, the bigger bulk is in UAE because a lot of people have to... Um, that's why we're trying to get in more planes. And that's why a lot of people also are homeless at the moment because uh, when the airports closed, they already cut ties with their um, landlords. But please uh, tell them to 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 um, contact us through OFW Help, Doctor. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, thank you very much, Yusek. This is a follow up question also on the public health system. Everywhere there is an overwhelming uh, <coughs> situation for public health system. Uh, Someone said, is Mr. Maralit espousing that sending countries set up their own health system in destination countries? Isn't this contrary to the basic principle that all migrants should be treated decently and be given access to public health system of or by the host countries? So that's one. And the other last one is, what's the uh, prospect for the GCC uh, to bounce back? Uh, so I think that those are questions for, for Froilan. <coughs> okay, so if you look at Gulf countries' policies with respect to migrants' access to public or private health institutions, if you get sick, for example, if you get COVID or you want to get testing in the public uh, health hospital, it's free if uh, you have all the symptoms and you're positive. So they can arrange that so you don't have to pay for that. But in the private sector, you do have to pay. Now, the biggest challenge here is when a lot of OFWs choose, even if they have symptoms, they choose not to go. Partly because of, you know, if they get become positive, uh, they could be either, they could either lose their job, they could be isolated, you know, they would practically lose their access to, you know, potential work, be it part-time, be it full-time, etc. So the government here, under their humanitarian service policies, they offer that, right? But not all actually maximize these, you know, opportunities. So I don't think there's a need for the Philippine government to create, you know, health facilities, right? For a lot of OFWC, what they need is actually a shelter. But the problem with the shelter is that if you create it like what India is currently doing, this is going to create a lot of costs. And this could really, you know, raise a lot of questions in terms of, you know, what actually is the, you know, official, you know, contingency approach of the Philippine government here. Do they want to repatriate? Do they want to help OFWs elongate these stay here? Specifically those for Filipinos who want to stay for the next six months or more. So to answer your question, Gulf countries, public health institutions, they actually work and they offer this. What we need is actually those additional shelters, but they require a lot of cost and there's a lot of like, you know, long-term issues uh, for our government. Now, in terms of like prospects, you know, for um, Dr. Edna, uh, you, you mentioned the, the prospect for Gulf markets. Is that the question? Yes, I think that's the spirit of the question. What's the projection uh, for the GCC countries to bounce back? Okay, so if you currently look at what they're doing right now, right? So COVID cases are going up and they're slowly opening it. So they're, you know, they're taking a lot of risks, actually. Um, 
So if you look at, for example, uh, Kuwait and UAE's phase one and phase two, initially, uh, workers can own, 30 percent of workers can allow to work, uh, you know, in the private sector, and they've changed that into 50 percent. Locals will be required, you know, to start working, you know, fully uh, starting June one. So if you look at their current, you know, uh, uh, policies, uh, they're trying to revive the market, right? By allowing them to function despite these, you know, the, the COVID problems. So this will actually, uh, to an extent, help a lot of OFWs to stay here a little bit longer because they're allowed to partially work. Now, what happens if, you know, COVID cases continue to go up, right? And the number of symptomatic or asymptomatic cases also go up, then that becomes a critical issue. That's when, you know, Gulf countries will start to think about, you know, the cost of, you know, protecting everyone by, you know, allowing them to access their public health institutions. Because at some point they would say, you know, enough is enough, right? We won't be able to do all of this because there are protecting migrant population by allowing them to access these things. Now, how do you link that to the future economic market, the prospects? Well, it would really depend on, you know, the availability of the vaccine. If you look at, you know, what the UN is saying, it's between 12 to 18 months. So I don't know who's going to survive for the next 12, 18 months with a closed economy or partially open economy. And, but if you look at what they're doing here, a lot of them are basically trying to, you know, partially open it, inject a lot of localization policies, deportation, and at the same time, selectively maintain certain essential workers that they know they would be needed, you know, in the market, like nurses, uh, domestic workers, and certain sectors in the private sector, like engineers, for example. So it's very uncertain. And I think it's conditional. Um, it's conditioned to these factors, availability of the vaccine, and whether firms would be able to pick up quickly, because a lot of them they filed for bankruptcy. The government has, in, the Gulf countries have injected 180 billion economic stimulus packages. But those things, you know, won't necessarily, you know, impact all these firms. So the question now is, you know, what would the market look like, like in the medium term, from six months up to, to after six months to one year? Because a lot of their policies are focused on the next three months. And golf, golf policies have not really defined, you know, from the fourth, you know, months and onward. So I can't really answer your question, but what I can tell you right now, they're taking a lot of risks and these risks, given what the UN is saying, what the data are saying, they would likely to, you know, impose a more harder repatriation uh, and more um, not so good, you know, economic outcome, you know, for the next six months. So. All right. Uh, so I think I'm sorry that uh, we don't have any more time for the other questions and for the other uh, discussion points. That's all the time that we have for the Q&A. And uh, we still have to wrap up uh, this whole session. But before I hand you over to Christine Dady of the, the IOM, I'd like to uh, say here that uh, UPC PAL Philippines has lined up four other uh, webinars for this coming month of June. Uh, all the four are related to uh, themes around sustainable development goals. So we have June 3, uh, food security in the midst of COVID-19 with the FAO joining UPC PAL Philippines. Uh, we also have on June 5, uh, Caring in the Time of COVID-19, Gaps and Risks Facing Filipino Women and the International Labor Organization uh, is joining us there as co-sponsor and organizer. On June 11, we have Nurture Nature, the Impacts of COVID-19 to the Planet and People. And uh, we have a number of uh, uh, co-organizers here, which include... Uh, the SDG Youth Force Philippines, uh, the Junior Chamber International and Iconic Travels, among others. Also the Youth for Earth Society. And on June 16, we have COVID-19 and young people uh, dealing with the impacts of pandemic on youth's well-being with the UP Department of Family Life and Child Development. But, but these are uh, interval sessions. I think basically UPC PAL Philippines and IOM will really have to go back, pick up the discussion some more, and pick up more forward-looking resolutions 
the ease of Filipino migration. I think this is really a very tough topic. So we'll have continuing uh, collaboration, discussion, exchanges of ideas, and hopefully putting things together. So uh, I think that's all the time that we have for now. It is uh, uh, the uh, it is my honor to turn over the 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 the, uh, the floor to uh, our good friend, our co-organizer, the chief of mission uh, to the Philippines of the International Organization for Migration, none other than Christine Baby. Christine, please. Hi. Can you hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Great. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Director um, Edna, for organizing this really rich and um, interesting discussion. Um, and my best regards to Undersecretary Sarah. Um, really, it's an honor to uh, have you on the panel together with Andre and, um, and Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Lorenzo. So great discussion. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge the um, the important topic of COVID and how the mobility crisis. But I'm going to come back to the to the way in which that was uh, titled in a minute. Um, but you know, I came back um, from this morning. This morning, I was actually I, I want to talk about the um, amazing efforts and the delicate efforts of the local school teams for the chest repatriation. Uh, OFW who so have chosen to uh, return home. I spent the morning down at the, uh, the uh, bus depot, the PIXT, um, and saw firsthand really the incredible effort that was going on to sort of return down uh, to these OFW. Um, really not an easy task, but what an amazing team. Team effort by uh, the Coast Guard, by DFA, by OMLA, by DOT, and of course by the private sector as well. It's it's really incredible. Um, I think that the Philippines is is probably uh, one of the countries leading the way in returning. Uh, Increase the audio, of their, please. Uh, of their workers, um, I recall early on, even when this crisis first started, um, Secretary Sarah uh, pointing out that. How they were sending planes. I mean, they were sending planes from China to Huan at the time to pick up their uh, OFWs at a, at a really early time in the uh, COVID uh, crisis. So, my hats off to the Filipino government for, for the return and the repatriation of thousands of workers with all these travel restrictions in place. I mean, it's undoubtedly uh, mobility is the defining um, feature of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Never, never before have we seen um, a disease spread uh, so far and so fast. Um, it shows how interconnected we really are. Um, never before has there been such a drastic movement of people just stopped. Uh, never before have we seen so many airports closed, so many ports of entries closed, so many people stranded. Um, and unfortunately, never before have we seen um, such existing inequalities between people and groups, and particularly a lot of the irregular um, migrant, migrant workers. Um, so it really it is a defining feature, and in that in that way, it has been it has been a mobility crisis. And I would agree with you, uh, Professor Edna, on the the title. Um, uh, hi, Ms. Davy. Can you please increase your audio? There. Okay. Now, That's can you perfect, hear me? Is perfect, that better? Perfect. Okay. I apologize. Sorry, it was a bit choppy. Um, I hope you heard all my um, all my congratulations to um, the government of the Philippines on returning and undertaking a massive operation of the return and the repatriation of the thousands of OFWs. Um, but what I was saying is that you know this is mobility has been a defining feature of the pandemic. Um, we've seen never before so many movements of people just just stop and be curtailed, so many airports closed, so many people stranded, um, and never before have we seen so many inequalities uh, between vulnerable groups and particularly irregular workers. Um, so that in that regard, um, Professor Edna, it has very much been a um, 
in, it has very much been a um, mobility crisis. But I think also we have to acknowledge that um, uh, the role that migration and mobility can play in the recovery. Um, I think I was asked to give a few statistics or a, a few comments on the remittances. And uh, undoubtedly, you know, global remittances, which drive so much of the economy globally, um, are projected to, to decline by 20%. And that is just a, a really um, incredible and, and devastating number and will lead to an economic crisis that our Secretary General has said we have not seen since the likes of the Great Depression. Um, so it, the remittances and the ties to migration are, are definitely going to be uh, devastating here in, in the Pacific and East Asia. The remittances are projected, according to the World Bank, to decline by 13%. Um, the Philippine government, uh, NEDA, has been anticipating a 20 to 30% decline in international remittances for 2020. Um, so it, it will have a devastating impact um, on, on the recovery. But migration can also play a role in the recovery. I think it would, it's really interesting in the National Migration Survey, um, which maybe many of you, I don't know if many of you have had the opportunity to look at, but the, there's an interesting statistic in there about the remittances from internal migration um, and the remittances from internal migration are just as great as the remittances from, according to the National Migration Survey, from external migration. So I think that's important, and that shows as well how important internal migration is to the economy here in the Philippines. So we can't forget that because I know a lot of the dialogue is so much focused on, on um, international migration. But... Uh, there's a big role to play in internal migration as well in the role of remittances in the, in the recovery. Um, Yusek Sarah made an important point on the importance of reintegration. And if I may, uh, Professor Edna or Director Edna, it would be really good to do a future, and maybe you already have organized that, but a future seminar on reintegration. Sure, sure. we'll do uh, it together. Let's do it together. Because yeah. this is, I think, um, really critical. I mean, I, we know that the yes. government's been very generous in providing pesos, uh, one-time peso payments to uh, vulnerable right. migrants. But I think we really need to look at the framework around reintegration post-COVID um, right. and how we can look at not just the individual reintegration, but the community reintegration aspects in, uh, in uh, a post-COVID environment. And we have a lot of good... Um, practices and, and best practices um, and looking at reintegration really from uh, a more holistic um, approach. So I think that would be an excellent topic for yes. um, we'll the future. Great, great. Um, and then finally, I mean, I just want to say that I do, I, I agree as well um, with, with you, Sex Sarah, that migration is a choice. Um, and we, I think it's commendable that the government has brought back those migrants who have chosen to return. Um, and we have to, you know, ensure we also, IOM is not in the business of promoting migration, but we are in the business of ensuring migration is safe and orderly and regular. So I think, ultim I think uh, uh, ultimately there will be um, a drive for migration, again, particularly to the, to the Midwest. I mean, I'm not an economist, but I just... I just suspect, and based on what I've been reading, particularly for certain economies, the caregivers, you're going to eventually bounce back uh, with the dramatic you know, need for migrant workers. Um, and so we have to ensure that migration takes place um, in a safe way, that people are not, because of the economic situation they're facing at home, are not feeling so um, you know, desperate that you have, uh, you know, uh, unscrupulous recruiters come in and take advantage of this desperation. So I think um, that'll be really important in the future. There, there, there will be, um, you know, migration has always driven economies and more so in the last 10 to 20 years, we've been more interconnected than ever before. Um, and so as countries start to open up and the demand will, um, you know, start up again for migrant workers, uh, because the econ their economies, as you've already pointed out, um, 
with all your data, their economies are very much dependent on migrant workers. We have to ensure that um, more than ever, that migration is safe, uh, that recruitment is done in a way that is most protective of migrant workers, that migrant workers aren't paying extraordinary fees to, to migrate. They shouldn't have to pay fees to, to um, be recruited. Nobody should have to pay a fee for their job. We continue to say that. Um, so uh, as we as we um, look at this as a as a mobility crisis, I think we also have to look at the opportunities that migration um, will bring in the in the post COVID recovery. And I also just want to recognize um, one of the you know the the amazing heroic efforts of so many migrant workers in as first line as first. Um, line responders. I mean, my country, I'm from America, um, and so many Filipino nurses who have um, passed away because of COVID and have been on the front line taking care of, um, you know, uh, COVID patients. Uh, let's not forget that migrant workers have really been the heroes in, in the COVID response as well. Um, so when people talk about, you know, the anti-discrimination and, and blame migrants for uh, for bringing COVID uh, to their country, we also have to uh, remind those that, that migrant workers have been on the front line of the response and many of them have given up their lives, um, unfortunately. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at this as not just a crisis, but an opportunity would be my final concluding word. So thanks to everybody on the panel. Thanks to Dr. Edna for organizing another rich discussion and seminar and I look forward to future ones and particularly one on reintegration. Uh, great, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, OMG, that's really fantastic uh, closing uh, remark from you. And that's an excellent added value of having someone from the IOM to come in and say, uh, the uh, mobility crisis is not just about the Gulf States, Philippines and back, but it's also about uh, uh, the uh, not just the international mobility, but also the internal the the internal migration issues, which then bring us to the point that at the end of the day, the bottom line really of migration and all programs relate to migration as a human right is bringing uh, well-being and the benefits of migration to each and every person to the community, and that brings us further into the. Uh, looking at it in terms of recovery from this COVID-19 crisis, uh, recovery from the wicked pandemic, uh, recovery and therefore which is also going to segue to, re uh, to, re uh, to reintegration. And I really uh, think that uh, there's so much more that all of these people who signed up as participants are uh, excellent players, uh, very vigorous players on the migration. And we, there is no other way but for us to continue the discussion, the conversation, and to pitch in in every way we can. So on behalf of the University of the Philippines, Philippines I'd like to really, really thank from the bottom of our hearts, uh, Froilan Malit, who's uh, really been very... Uh, always at the side of UP Philippines, uh, UP CIPAL on the migration issue. Uh, so with uh, the uh, uh, honorable, hardworking uh, Yusek Saralu Ariola, our dear friend from the industry, Lito Soriano, and of course, our, um, our constant companion in our conversations on migration, Christine Davy. Thank you to everyone, and this would not have been possible without the hard work of all the staff in UPC PAL Philippines. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much, the whole world, for listening to this conversation. And we look forward to the next one. So please hang on. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Edna. Thank you. Thank you, Yusef. Bye, everyone. Thank you.